We are the first credit information bureau in the South Asian region. We maintain credit information in order to facilitate credit to everyone. We at Crib do not blacklist. Loan applications are easier if your credit information is with Crib. Crib reports do not provide recommendations. We do not give our opinion. The Credit Information Bureau of Sri Lanka. We help create a credit worthy society. Association of International Certified Professional Accountants. Welcome to LMTV, Gramanan. Great to have you as our first international guest. Thank you for having me on board. It's a pleasure to be on LMTV TV. Venkat, in the wake of this pandemic, what would you say are the three must-haves uh, for the business leaders of today? I think we have to start from the perspective of uh, people. So the biggest thing that we need to have is empathy. Because uh, the pandemic would have touched every one of us in different ways. And leaders, we need to be very empathetic to the challenges that the teams may be facing. Uh, we need to be able to take time to understand what they're going through. Uh, they may not be in the same environment as each one of us. They will be in different environments. So we need to really understand what the team is going through and build in that empathy. Because at the end of the day, uh, without the team, we are not in completeness. That's, that's very, very important. And it's just the empathy is not just to understand in terms of their physical well-being. Also, one of the biggest challenges that are coming is the mental well-being. Remember, Anush and people are used to traveling to work, meeting with uh, colleagues over a cup of tea or a cup of coffee, having lunch, uh, integrating them physically with the meeting. Now they have to be fathers or mothers. They have to be husbands or wives. They have to be father-in-laws or daughter-in-laws. They have um, uh, they, they have to look after their kids. They have challenges at home they need to overcome. And of course, the responsibility to uh, manage the work uh, effect. So empathy is critically important. Second part of it is being agile. Um, everything doesn't remain constant and everything will not remain constant in the way we do. So knowing how to do things in different ways and having an understanding to be agile enough. I mean, your work time may not be nine to five anymore. But building the empathy and, and uh, agility, you may be able to start at a different time uh, after you manage things at home and then building that uh, agility in terms of not our mindset, but it's also in terms of who we may be as an organization, as a business. Uh, how do we look at suppliers and customers? We need to have that very different uh, perspective of agility. And the third thing I think is innovation, because during a crisis, there's always an opportunity. Business leaders always look for an opportunity. Uh, crisis don't come often, corrections don't come often, and when those things do take place, we need to look at what is going to be the greater positive impact on our business and actually drive that greater positive impact. So it is the empathy, agility, and innovative mindset. It's much to do with the way we look at things rather than anything external. Now, you mentioned empathy towards employees' uh, uh, situations, but how can employers ensure or, and, or motivate employees to actually work and not uh, uh, not take advantage of the work from home concept. The motivation aspect is you've got to understand what drives a person to do something that's needed. And remember, Anush, and I, I don't know about you, but most people during this time are asking what their purpose is like because they also do uh, have, have faced a situation where you're surrounded by different things. You're, if you look at the news, please do tell me when there's a positive news that comes out. It does. It. There are a lot of negativity in terms of the COVID implications uh, about uh, economic uh, recessions that are happening, whether it's the U curve, V curve, K curve, different aspects of it. Um, there, there are different issues that are happening across the world. The point that you've got to understand is that everyone is evaluating and reevaluating their sense of purpose, not only in terms of who they are, but even the organizations that they work for. If you are able to understand really what drives and motivates a person, if you're able to empower and trust them more than you have ever done, why hasn't work from home worked before, Anush? And it's because I believe most leaders did not trust their staff, right? I mean, if you ask them to work from home, they're like, are you actually looking for things? People sometimes even set meetings in the morning because they want you to make sure that you're starting things. The trust aspect, the empowerment, the greater understanding that individuals and collectively as a team that can do a lot more is needed. Working from home is you are at home and working, not you are working from home. You are at home and working. We've got to recognize that, number one. 
we got to recognize that every one's um, model of the world in which they operate is not the same from yours and mine. Um, I may be living with my wife and daughter, but not everybody has the same consideration. Somebody may have to look after their father, their mother. So you have to give them allowance in terms of time to set themselves first. What's important is during a pandemic, families first. There's no two questions about that. If you say, I don't care about what you do with your family, but you've got to do my work and I need a re report to be given, I can tell you nobody's going to be motivated. They will do it, but then there are other subsequent uh, issues that you've got to face. So put yourself in their environment, understand them, and when you empower them, they will turn around and do what's necessary. Uh, Venkat, how do uh, companies balance the short-term strategies uh, uh, needed right now uh, in terms of uh, overheads and uh, cash flows uh, with, uh, with the need to keep the longer-term vision also in mind? So in the, in the shorter term, what's important is, uh, you're right, they manage the cash flows, right? The liquidity position, because the liquidity ca cash flow is the lifeline of any business. So the security that is required for survival in the next three, four, five, six months is to make sure your liquidity position is looked after, your cash flows are secure. If you have assets, can you utilize those assets to get cash, um, uh, short-term cash positions? Because it's important. But while you do that, You've got to redefine who you are and what your customers are. In the same way, your customers may not want things uh, in the past that they would now. Look, for example, universities. I mean, look at the parents which send their kids overseas to study. Uh, they're going to be assessing decisions around, am I going to make that investment for Zoom classes to be followed, where the whole experience of being in an overseas environment is to be able to um, absorb culture, enjoy the infrastructure, uh, network with people, and so on and so forth. Look at airlines right now. They're not flying. Their load capacity is so low that they are going to be struggling to do airlines. Singapore Airlines now offers unique dining experience where you can have first class, business class, and uh, economic class meals in a plane. So you've got to understand what your customers' wants are. Assess them immediately. You need to understand whether your, your technology is capable of making any changes to the requirements of customers. You've got to understand what part of your business does not make sense and make those changes, but critical to the whole thing is people. So in the medium term, use your best people to be able to advise you in terms of how can we improve cash flow? How can we look at business models to be reintegrated differently? How do we look at customers and suppliers differently? What are the things that are changing that we see opportunities? That medium term is to build a position that world is going to be, you know what, not the same anymore. Things are going to viably change constantly. The only cha change in life is constant. And build our resilience so that anytime those changes do take place, we can meet them. I mean, Anushan, when you go, when you have a flu, the first thing that you do is you don't run to the doctors to ask them for medication. You take your vitamin C's, you drink a lot of water, you do home remedy first because you're building resilience. Only when the resilience starts disappearing, do you look for external factors to support. So business is just like that. We've got to build the resilience that we can self-sufficiently support ourselves, whether it's altering our business model, uh, looking at customers differently, looking at technology opportunities, and then keep redefining what our purpose is as a business. We may have started out as the next business, but we may end up as Y business because we have different stakeholders, needs who we need to fulfill on it. How do you uh, think business leadership uh, should evolve after this crisis is over? So Anushan, it's a very interesting question because when there were different surveys and feedback that was done, the biggest thing that came out in terms of uh, the, the business leadership, the critical area is trust. How business leaders come out being trustworthy, either from external stakeholders or even your staff. Uh, because what you say and what you do, they look to you, the choices of words, the actions that you take, uh, the optics in terms of your decisions, everything is going to be considered in a different way. The key aspect, I believe, is empowerment and trust becomes important. Uh, leaders who, are, who have greater compassion and care for their well-being of their teams will be seen as the organizations that will survive and grow. There's no question about that. We've got to be very flexible. We cannot hide behind policies about the way we used to do things. We have to be agile with our policies, our structures, and agile with how we respond to this pandemic. So working times may change, and better agility makes people connect with you. Lastly, we have to be, as leaders, resilient. There'll be more good news, sorry, there'll be more bad news than good news. 
We need to be able to take it. We need to be able to filter the bad stuff, communicate the good stuff so that we keep our people motivated. And what we have to do is understand two important things with that. We need to create an inclusive environment. We need to bring our teams wider together, not just with the first line reports that we always speak with, but we've got to bring the wider organization and communicate to them directly of what our messaging is. The important point, keep killing your team. Because the more you think you know, the less you're able to do. The more you think you have to unlearn and relearn, the more value can bring to an organization. So as leaders, we have to be value enablers and we need to understand and continue to trust that our people will be able to build that value. So reskilling is critical, either complete reskilling or partial reskilling and create that training environment. And this is where the difficulty lies during a pandemic or a crisis. Uh, one of the things that we see are being cut down our training budgets. I would say one of the things that you have to hold on to is your training budgets because when opportunities do arise, people with skills and mindset shifts can take you forward. So that's what's essential from a business leadership perspective. We're going for a short break now. We'll be right back after this. Welcome back to the show as we continue our discussion with our first international guest, the Regional Vice President, Asia Pacific of the Association of International Certified Professional Accountants, Venkat Ramanan. Venkat, now you monitor a number of countries and uh, regions. Uh, what would you say are the lessons learned from this pandemic? So for us, if we look at it, uh, the resilience is the key aspect. One of the things that we understood, uh, the lessons learned, the organizations are not resilient to face let alone a black swan event, but if you look at things that are risk, uh, they create wider risk organizations or not. So for example, SEMA uh, and AICPA, we formed the Association of the International Certified Professional Accountants. One of the things that we were able to do was the business model was resilient enough to withstand anything that takes place. And it's not just the resilience as an organization, but we, how do we build resilience within the team? That's the key lessons that we said. The other thing is we need to be crisis ready. I mean, ever so often what we find is when you look at uh, technology to be uh, integrated and technology is a servant to the organization, people make technology work by, the, by, by essence. Very often C CFOs and finance directors and others would ask what's the ROI and technology implementation in organizations take longer before understanding things uh, in terms of the benefits. So, faster push in terms of how we can automate, improve effectiveness and efficiency and keep connecting with our customers. How can we be crisis ready in terms of using technology as opportunities wherever? We need to look at performance measurements uh, and performance management slightly different because not everything that we need to do may be important. Uh, what we need to do is make an impact with our customers, make an impact with the stakeholders and make an impact in terms of the purpose, in terms of who we are. How can new leaders be nurtured? Because we need new thoughts and ideas right now. But these, uh, the next generation of leaders just don't seem to be stepping up. I, I think, Arishan, the first point is we need to have a different mindset uh, about how we approach everything in totality. The older ways of doing things don't necessarily uh, mean it's successful. And older ways of doing things is not going to get us there. Uh, we have to understand that. So if you ask us what we need to nurture in leaders, is we've got to trust that people can make impact. Um, the trust deficit is high when we have a certain set of ways of doing things and when we don't understand what the younger leaders can bring in. I mean, you, you have to have that trust. So nature, nurturing, it always goes back to that distance of trust. The second aspect is um, in nurturing future leaders, we need to be d digital first. Uh, when I say digital first, I've got to be very careful. I usually put people first and digital next. But being digital is important in nurturing leaders because they see opportunities. Younger generations see opportunities that if it dances in front of us, we don't even see. Younger generation, however, don't see risk if it dances in front of them, which we do see because experience has taught us to tackle things differently. How do we bring our risk and uh, how do we take the opportunities from a digital end that they're able to bring it? So nurturing leaders, we need to guide them through the risk-related uh, uh, issues that may occur, but we need to understand that the opportunities uh, are there. We need to look at data and we need to look at insights. 
when making decisions. So nerd, a lot of leaders you will see say, I have this gut feeling, I have this inhibition, this is going to happen. That's all great. That's important because when it comes to a critical point of decision, it's your conscious that uh, makes a decision in terms of what makes it work. But have the correct insights and the correct data to support those insights is important because insights are the ones that make impact. Because if you don't have any data that can make the insights, you can't make an impact. The other thing that we need to do is in terms of creating an innovative culture and having leaders uh, in nurturing them to embed agility and speed and how do you nurture that further? Because younger leaders, if you look at it, they want to get things done yesterday. They don't care about today or tomorrow. They want things faster. And they know where to source it. They're quite clever. Whether it's Generation Z or whether it's Alpha, you'll see them knowing where to be able to find those opportunities. So we need to uh, support them in terms of the agility, the adaptability, the speed in which they want to. We need to trust in that. The key aspect of leadership Communication, collaboration, how do you consistently communicate? I might have certain things that I think here, Anushan, and if you're not able to understand it, I fail in my communication. And I only get you to collaborate if you feel you're part of my journey. So in nurturing that the communication, the collaboration are things that are important. And there are other things like character qualities, Anushan, which need to be brought in. Persistence, never give up. Curiosity, ask questions. I do believe when we were brought up as children, we were told quite often in school and other places to shut up and not ask questions. But if you look at the generation, we have to allow them to have that curiosity to ask more questions, because when you're curious, you're able to look at things differently. And of course, the important aspect is to take initiative, not wait for a solution to be given. If you nurture, if leaders are coming out, taking initiative, support that further. And we are no more as much as we are national in the way we are doing things, the pandemic first shift is to be totally um, in country, right? So we are trying to produce for our own, sell it to our own because global borders have changed. But the world as it shifts and technology adaptation looks greater and bigger, having social and cultural awareness in ever greater, the diversity, the thinking becomes even more critical. So leaders with social and cultural awareness, knowing different mentalities, different cultures, different extent to which how different people function and having diversity in thinking and diversity in understanding are the ones. So if we embed all of these into our leaders and, and enable that mindset shift, we can achieve a lot more. Nisha. In the context of the accounting profession, what are the changes that have come about? Oh, well, the, the important fact uh, for me is that we now see uh, CFOs uh, getting the right position in terms of who they are because CFOs have always been uh, strategic leaders, but now more than ever, they're being identified as a strategic leader. When a pandemic or any situation arises, the first thing that everybody looks for is a man with the money. Uh, but it's just not the man with the money who can make decisions to provide or empower or give budget, but how they connect with the business, how they understand people, how do they connect with the uh, leaders across and make decisions. So one of the things that we see is in the finance function and the profession is that finance people are always looked at the back office. They're never the back office. They're always front and center in everything that they do. The criticism made it that the back office focus is because they are very strong in their technical skills, but finance leaders who have people, leadership, and business skills supported by the technical skills are always seen as strategic leaders. The second thing is we will see greater response to automation. We will see the finance function shrinking in terms of technology integration, which is RPA, whether it's AI, whether it's the use of bots in terms of providing analysis. So data extraction, data entry, and analysis can be great extent done by technology or by BPOs, the shared service operations that are taking part or, or provided by different organizations. They're capable of doing that, which means finance leaders are moving up the value chain to become better value enablers. They're becoming strategic business partners. And that's something that we are seeing. We also need to understand that digital workforce will grow. So collaborative environment in keeping connectivity uh, is an important thing to communicate, to collaborate with a wider function of finance people who are working from home, that's critical. And the most important thing from that, Anushan, is that we are always value enablers. Well, let's hope that companies take heed of the valuable advice offered. Thank you very much for talking to us, Venkat. It was a great pleasure. Thank you, Anushan, and thank you, LMD, for having us. We appreciate it.
After a short break, Ashwini Vedakan brings you an update of the latest LMB Nielsen Business Confidence Index. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the show, I'm Ashni Vedakan. With the emergence of a new cluster of COVID-19 cases in early October, the Ministry of Health sought to gazette new regulations under the Quarantine and Prevention of Disease Ordinance to stop the virus in its track. This involved penalties for those found in contravention of the rules. Not surprisingly, this has meant a virtual return to a period of lockdown for the public and all those services deemed as essential to the dismay of corporate establishments across the island. So it follows that the latest LMD Nielsen Business Confidence Index survey too reflects a dip in sentiment given the prevailing conditions. The BCI, which had been making progress following the end of the island-wide curfew, has trended down once again amid the prevailing situation in the island. The BCI for October stands at 115, which is five basis points lower than the index value in the previous month. Nielsen's Director of Consumer Insights, Terika Miyadenio, observes that with the coming of the second wave of COVID-19 in Sri Lanka, where numbers have been escalating by the day and isolated cases connected to the Minuangara cluster are emerging all over, fear has begun to grip the country once again. Although there is no official lockdown of the nation as a whole, a number of businesses and private corporates are in a state of self-imposed lockdown. The impact of the coronavirus continues to be the most pressing issue for businesses in Sri Lanka, with the majority of corporate executives expressing this fear. In addition, inflation, high taxes and interest rates are cited as concerns, although garnering much lower prominence among respondents than COVID-19. Apprehension over the spread of the coronavirus has also escalated among business people when it comes to major issues warranting urgent national attention, with the economy also being mentioned in this regard. Whereas last month's analysis of the BCI prompted muted optimism over the future direction of the index. The latest news on the COVID-19 front has come as a shock to businesses and people alike. Miena Denia comments that with government resources being stretched as part of efforts to curtail a second wave of infections and businesses as well as the public opting for self-imposed lockdown, the BCI is expected to fall further in the coming months. Once more, with Budget 2021 scheduled for presentation later this month, the prospects of a turnaround in the index appear somewhat bleak at this juncture. Perceptions among business executives with regard to the economy in general seem to have worsened with only a third of respondents to the latest BCI survey, stating that economic conditions are likely to improve in the coming 12 months compared to 48% saying so in September. Meanwhile, 31% of those polled are of the view that the economy will stay the same over the 12 months ahead, whereas a slightly higher number of 35% believe that the nation's economic trajectory is likely to deteriorate further. Where long-term sentiment in relation to business prospects is concerned, half of the survey sample, down from 68% in the previous month, anticipates sales volumes to record an improvement next year. Although the majority of respondents conveyed optimism regarding short-term biz prospects as recently as in August, a mere 31% versus the 37% in September of the corporate execs consulted for the latest BCI survey say sales volumes will get better in the three months ahead. Turning to the prevailing investment climate in the country, 29% of the survey participants suggest that this is a good time to invest. This represents an improvement from the prior month when only 17% of respondents were as positive. However, another 35% of those spoken to by the pollsters point to the prevalence of an unfavourable investment climate, while a marginally higher number choose to describe present funding conditions as fair. The majority 89% of poor respondents say their companies will maintain the workforce in the coming six months. This means that only 7% of those surveyed plan to increase their staff counts over the six months ahead, while slightly over 1 in 10 business people concede they may have to resort to retrenchments during this period. That's all we have for you this week. Don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel and follow us on Facebook and Twitter.
Thank you for watching and stay safe.